Matt uh, and I go back a long way. Uh, like Christian, he worked with me at Canonical back in about 2008, 2010. And I was employee 165 there. What number were you, Matt? I was 165. Yeah. So I think he was kitchen table stage. He was about 50, 60 when it really was a true startup. And um, I won't embarrass him, but he was incredibly, incredibly young. And it's a source of great pride to me to have seen a young man who wasn't long out of university have the wherewithal to spot a sector that was burgeoning. He was one of the first people to have a Kubernetes startup anywhere in the world. Um, he's done very, very well out of it. And he's a tremendously impressive young man still, which makes me feel very old. Matt, can I hand over to you for yes. your panel? Thank you for the kind words, Amanda. Very embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Um, what a great day it's been so far. I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, I'm learning a lot about the benefits of open source, open standards, open technology when it comes to sustainability. And um, one of the things that I'm doing as entrepreneur in residence is how we try and help create the right conditions to create sustainable communities around open source and open source technology uh, and open technology. And how do we encourage more founders to start businesses in this space? And um, today, I'm very happy to be running this panel with some very esteemed guests to my left. We have Liz Rice, who's the Chief Op Open Source Officer at Isovalent and the Chair of the Technical Oversight Committee at the CNCF. We have Lowena, uh, uh, Lowena Hull, a student at Cambridge University and Open UK Kids Camp Creative Director. We have the lady herself, Amanda Brock, CEO of Open UK. And we have Will Page, the author of Tarzan Economics, Eight Principles for Pivoting Through Disruption, and the former chief economist of Spotify. Does anyone know how much money or venture capital was spent on technology companies in 1978? Any guesses? Quiz, is it? <laughs> it was just over $200 million. Anyone know how much has gone into software companies this year so far? About half a trillion already? About 10 years ago, and everyone knows this already, but Mark Andreessen said that software is eating the world. And when you hear stats like that, it starts to make you realize that that's true. But I was a, I've been a little bit surprised. I kind of thought that when software was eating the world over the past 10 years, that it was going to totally disrupt all of our existing companies. And really, it hasn't. Arguably, the pandemic's done more to accelerate digital transformation than, um, than the software uh, movement itself. But what we have seen is a number of companies completely revolutionize in industries by building from scratch, by starting from the bottom, bottom up. There's been a couple of uh, conversations earlier in the previous panel around, around Tesla. And Tesla, as you know, just recently reached a, a trillion dollar valuation. Um, Ford, for example, is now valued at 77 billion. And, and the difference is Tesla was built from the, from the ground up, uh, very technologically uh, driven. And if you look at the types of software that these companies are using, nowadays there's not a huge difference in the infrastructure that's being built and, um, and open source itself. Open source software and open technology pretty much is infrastructure. And Francis Moore this morning talked about some of the creation of the value in some of the valuations of companies like MongoDB and Elastic and Confluent and so on. And I think as we can all agree, open source software leads to better outcomes. And right now, we're in a moment in time where because open source software and open technology is becoming the foundation of infrastructure, we have the ability as a country to be able to take advantage of that and build on the success that we've already created in this space. So I've been doing some research over the past six months as my role as entrepreneur in residence. And um, I found out a lot about how people are responding to and thinking about open source software. And We've got a lot of good things in the UK that we've done already. So we have a great legal system. We have a lot of great open source uh, and open technology startups. We have um, some excellent engineers. But we are lacking, when I speak to a lot of people who want to, to get involved in open technology, in their ability to engage and a lack of knowledge around how to do that. Most of the people I spoke to actually fell into open source and open technology by accident. And what we really want to do with Open UK is try and create a way to help people to get into uh, the, um, the community and actually help, to, help them to create businesses. 
I was really fortunate because there's many people in this room that helped me seven years ago when I was starting my business around um, open source software. But I had the network, I had the connections already. And a lot of the people that I spoke to who are really keen to try and engage are finding it very, very difficult uh, to do that. So what I'm hoping to do uh, in my role is to make it, give, give those people who want to start these businesses the same opportunities that I did. And um, I'm very happy to say that in the, in the new year, um, we'll be creating a, or we have created, a mentorship program, which means that anyone who's interested uh, in, in using open technology to actually start businesses will actually be able to contact me, and I'll be able to put them in contact with the same people that helped me. And we're going to formalize that with a series of training courses in the early, uh, early next year. And there is a link that I can actually share, which is, do you want to do it? <laughs> it's openuk.uk forward slash founders forum. So I would, I would suggest that if anyone knows anyone who's interested in, in getting the help to start a business in this space, to please uh, write that down and fill out the, um, uh, the Google form or get them to do that. So my hope is that by focusing on how we can improve this knowledge sharing and get people involved, we're going to create more founders, we're going to get more open source projects, and we'll, we'll be building a more sustainable open future together. So these are some of the themes that I'd like to, dis uh, to explore with the panel. So I'll, I'll head on over. Liz, you're a very powerful lady. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <intro. laughs> you have the influence of thousands and thousands of developers through your role in the CNCF. Can you talk a little bit about how you think about engaging those developers and making them successful? Yeah, so for just quickly show of hands, how many people here have heard of the CNCF? Actually, probably the majority, but not 100% of people. So it's part of the Linux Foundation, and it's, uh, it stands for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It owns software like Kubernetes and Prometheus and Envoy a bunch of open source projects that allow people to run their software in what we call cloud native ways. So this is dynamically scalable and uh, efficient use of your compute resources. And somehow, and I might touch on how in a second, these projects have engaged huge numbers of people. There's like 140,000 people from almost every country on the planet who contribute to CNCF projects. So that's you know, unheard of numbers of, of participants. And I think a big part of how that's happened is because right from the get-go, right from the inception of the CNCF, people thought very intentionally about how to engage people, how to get people involved in that community, how to create pathways through, you know, from your very first, you know, raising your first issue or um, going to a meetup to becoming a more active participant and getting more and more responsibility in that open source community. So I think there's been a lot of work. These things don't happen by accident. They're intentional pathways. And I think that's really important to sustainable community. Fantastic. Thank you, Liz. I'd ask uh, people to take... Uh note of some of the conversations we're having, and please feel free to engage with questions uh, as we get through the, um, uh, some of these, these discussions. Loena, you've obviously been working closely on the Open UK Kids Camp and working with the Glove. Can you tell us a bit about what the response to that has been and what you're trying to achieve with that initiative? Yeah, so the response has been, quite frankly, phenomenal. So we have decided to give away, we managed to give away 5,000 Glove Kits this year which is an increase from 3,000 the year before. And we have completely run out, and there is still demand for more. So it's a project that's making quite a big, a huge impact, uh, particularly on digitally excluded groups all across the UK. And the aim is to build on the first year's course by sort of building it up, introducing slightly more complex coding con concepts and really making sure kids understand what open source is. So we have 10 lessons in this year's course, and each lesson focuses on a different point of the open source definition. And we're trying to break that down from the complex definitions down to something that kids can really understand. So in this course, we have three main objectives. One is to introduce open source. 
The second is to help improve kids' programming skills. And the third is to really make kids be aware of and understand the importance of the UN Sustainability Goals. Excellent. Thank you. Amanda. I'm just blown away by her. I, honestly, she's 19. And um, at the beginning of this year, we were trying to work out what to do with the kids' course. We did one last year. It was hugely, hugely successful. And we did it with the wonderful David Whale, who's in the EdTech uh, Hall of Fame. You know, he's one of the top 50 educationalists in the UK. And I just didn't know where to go because David couldn't do it a second year. Now, Matt, who is drawing at the back of the room, did all the animation for us. Steph, who you saw in the voiceover earlier, does all our voiceovers. We've got a fantastic team and we didn't know what to do. And we sort of had a hole. And I phoned Louina up. And of course, when I phoned her, anybody who knows me, don't take the call if you don't want to do it. <laughs> so I phoned Louina up and she... <laughs> I'm honest about it. I phoned Louina up and it was great because I didn't have to ask. And she actually jumped in and went, I'll do it, before I even got to ask her, you know, a woman after my own heart. And it was a huge pun and a huge risk, right? And I spoke to a couple of people, but I knew it was the right thing. Instinctively, I knew it was the right thing to do to put my faith in her. And I think we have created one of the most important pieces of tech education anywhere in the world. Last year, we were second. I know that probably sounds really arrogant, but I truly believe it. Last year, we were second in the GNOME Community Challenge. I think if we'd had this year's content, we'd have wiped the floor with everyone else. Uh, it's amazing. We have just published Lesson 3. Lesson 4 goes live on Monday. It's entirely free to use. It's licensed Creative Commons. We're looking at getting some Welsh speakers to help us translate it into Welsh. If anybody wants to take it and translate it into their languages, be my guest. We'll give you the scripts. We'll do whatever we can to help. The gloves are themselves open sourced. So we, you, there's a template, you can go and cut it out. The microbit foundation are outside, go and negotiate with them and get your microbits, and you're off. It's all it takes for you to learn about sustainability, open source software, and the open source definition. Now, I'm not meant to be talking to you about that. I'm meant to be telling you about our reports. Um, in July, I created a deck for my board that we shared with the ambassadors and the leadership team. And again, it was overwhelming because we've achieved so much in just under two years. And the first board strategy meeting took place in January 2020. Since then, you know, we're around 130 volunteers. I know there are some people who've been trying to approach me today. We'd love to have all of you. Please don't give up if I'm not very accessible today. Speak to one of the others here or DM me or find me, you know, amanda.brock Amanda at openuk.uk. My phone number is everywhere, unfortunately. But please help yourself. Um, and what I'm meant to be talking to you about is the reporting. And Matt's been talking about VCs and investment. Christian was talking about the opposite of that and how we look towards societal benefits of open source. Now, when we got to January, I was interviewed by an amazing lady who can't be here today. Uh, she's got some family health issues, Jennifer Barth. And I was interviewed for her report she was doing. And sometimes I can be a bit slow. I suddenly realized that we needed a report. So I phoned her and she picked up. And before she knew it, she was creating a report for Open UK. And what we did is we went out and we found all the reports that exist about open source around the world. And we pulled them together in state of open. So openuk.uk backslash state of open. And you'll find phases one to three. Phase one is a literature review that cuts the data for the UK that had never been done. I don't know if it had been done in any country before, actually. Uh, it was just phenomenal what she did. Then we went and did our first survey in June, and we found, no, I'm terrible with numbers. I've had COVID, and I'm a bit dippy. Um, I, I think it was 80%, 87? 87% of UK companies use open source. Mm -hmm. I think something like 96% of them engage with open source, but 87% run it. So we have these great stats, and what we also found was that the UK was number one in Europe by number of developers. And when we left the Commission, uh, when we left the EU, the European Commission reduced the numbers in their calculations from 490,000 to 260,000. They thought almost half of the open source people around Europe were based in the UK. And if you speak to the folk who make up our organization, you'll find they're from all over Europe, they're from all over the world, they're just based in the UK. Um, doing that report was interesting 
because I think the way it's valued is entirely wrong. So we used everybody else's figures, we used their calculations, we used their methodologies. We were even able to publish the UK version of the European Commission's formula before they did. So we did it and it irks me and it will always irk me. And yeah, it's like, I think 42, up to 42 billion of GDP per annum comes from open source in the UK. But actually, that's not the real value. That's not the real figure. And I struggle with how we, we find a way to value that. So we, we've done this work to start to shift, to bring in those other collaboration, skills development, societal benefits around open, and to try and calculate that. And I'm gonna hand over to Will in a moment, and he'll talk about economics. But you'll see in the third phase of our report, we sort of uh, were agile and we, we moved and we changed our mind. And as our sustainability work became more embedded in the business and went deeper and deeper, we realized that we have to move towards that. Now, I really wanted to make several announcements in this panel, the first being Matt's Founders Forum training and mentoring program, which is a, a, was up there a second ago. It's openuk.uk backslash Founders Forum. Um, I wanted to make another couple of announcements and I can't and I'm really annoyed, but there's nothing I can do. So we've just, we think, won something with somebody else in the room that is super, super exciting. I think we'll probably be able to tell you next week. We also will be doing some work that I think is totally groundbreaking next year. And what we're going to do is we are going to find a way to evolve the metrics and benchmark open source against sustainability in a hard, tangible format. Don't ask me how, but we're going to do it. And we're going out now to raise the money. We're talking to people about it to make sure that this is properly funded and delivers well, something that people across the planet will want to use as their benchmark and collaborate with us on. If anyone's interested in being involved, our next workshop, we do them every three months, is 10th of December. Again, just you know, contact us through the website. Um, that piece will start with the SDGs, but expect it to evolve. Whether it ends up benchmarking against the SDGs, who knows? But it's something that needs to belong to all of us, and it's something that needs to keep evolving over time. Long after I'm not in Open UK, I need the young people in this room, like Loena, like Alison, uh, Femi out there. I need you to be keeping this going and picking up that mantle. Follow that. <laughs> Will. Will. <laughs> Will, you, uh, you, you were um, chief economist at Spotify, mm -hmm. which makes you very helpful for a music round at the quiz last night. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I actually named the songwriters in that quiz and I never got the publishing, so. <laughs> but you, you're, you're doing a lot of work in how to measure the impact of sustainability mm -hmm. and in open source. So what's being measured right now and what could we be, be doing better? Yeah, so I mean, I don't need to repeat, reiterate, recycle what's been said in this amazing event so far and to echo what brings us all to Glasgow. And as someone from Edinburgh, I just have to quickly say, for Glasgow, a city which isn't even the nation's capital, doesn't even have a castle, <laughs> what an incredible <laughs> event. Um, but I am here to throw a clangor in the works. Yeah, Bouncy Castle, we'll deflate that in a minute. Um, I want to throw a clangor into the works, which is I get the energy in the room, I get the aspirations. We're not working on this project full time, we're working on it in our sleep, and that's not an exaggeration. We're thinking about this topic endlessly, but is any of our work, any of our achievements, any of our goals actually being measured? When I say measured, I'm talking about statistics, statisticians respective countries in this room, your statistical trade bodies, the Office of National Statistics, which is based in Newport and Wales. You know, where is it being measured? So here's my pitch and here's my concern. My pitch is what matters most is being measured least. It's that simple. My concern is technology is everywhere except in government statistics. So I'm going to give you two examples and I'll toss it back to our moderator for Q&A. But the first one I want to land and expand with everyone is to think about Wikipedia for a second. Based on my rudimentary calculations, Wikipedia is the sum of all the world's knowledge. It does no environmental damage, and it adds bodily squat to gross domestic product. Now, I want everyone in this room to think of stuff which is not the sum of all the world's knowledge, does terrible environmental damage, 
and adds a shit ton to gross domestic product. And you can see right there where we have a diversion. What matters most is being measured least. Now, if I bring it closer to home, to the subjects that are close to the heart of my fellow panelists here, if you think about the cloud, where is the cloud in GDP? There are three issues here. Firstly, where is it located? Is it actually in the UK? Is it offshore? Is it all booked in the headquarters in Seattle offices? Secondly, how is it classified? Not to get too deep into the economics, but follow me here. If I have a local data server, then I've invested in capital. If I get rid of that and adopt a cloud, I become much more efficient, but I'm no longer investing in capital. It's current expenditure. It's a leasing agreement. I'm leasing AWS for my company. Where in economic theory does reducing capital investment boost productivity? Right there, I've just overturned 75 years of economic logic. And then thirdly, how is it priced? Bezos law, if I get this correct, is a unit of cloud falls by half every three years. How do you account for that when you're measuring inflation? So my real worry is that GDP's got lost in the cloud as one example of technology, and our national statistical bodies haven't got a hope in hell of capturing it. And you can ditto that across technology, and in particular the climate issues that we're dealing with here as well. And let me just wrap up by reiterating what matters most is being leisure least. If I think about the Americans that I've met in this room and your current president who will be allocating money away from what adds to GDP, let's say military spend, and towards climate change, which doesn't add to GDP, well, what did Bill Clinton say? It's the economy, stupid. If the economy was to enter a recession because he's doing the right thing, he won't see four more years. So it's really worth trying to tackle this issue from a measurements perspective. What matters most is being measured least, and we need to correct that. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions or comments from the audience? OK, I'll start off with a, with a question for the panel. So we talked about um, how to engage people and get more people into our space. Liz, how do you think about that um, at the CNCF? And what, what action are you taking to try and help people to, to get involved? So. I think, as I mentioned before, you know, it's been part of the CNCF's kind of uh, the fabric of it to think about how community gets involved, and you know, really a handful of individuals who are passionate about it right from the get-go, uh, and organising events for people, uh, you know, Kubernetes community and cloud-native conferences have become quite a big thing. And the community thrives on that ability to get together. But something we've learned in the pandemic is, well, you know, <laughs> you have to be able to thrive without the ability to get together. And I think we've learned a lot about how to maintain communities and how to sort of make the best, like every other industry. You know, we've all figured out how to have effective meetings on Zoom. Um, CNCF you know, two years ago was having 12,000 person events, huge, you know, an amazing ability to exchange ideas, but maybe a little bit overwhelming. We had to adapt. We've done online conferences. Last month, we had the first hybrid KubeCon event, and that was a really interesting learning from a kind of sustainability point of view in, in a lot of different senses. For quite a lot of us, we couldn't go there. It was in the US. The US border was not open to everyone. Um, so it was a hybrid event that you could participate in virtually. And you don't get the same experience, but you do get an ability to participate. And I think that's really important going forward. And also, right from the get-go, the CNCF has been really conscious about diversity and inclusivity. And part of that traditionally was funding people to travel to these yep. events. And now we're saying, well, we can just charge a nominal fee, if anything, for people to attend virtually. That's great from an inclusivity perspective. But what I observed was it's also good from a business perspective, because it turns out there are loads of people who don't go to those events because they don't have the time. But they can afford to take a, you know, two or three hours. They, can't, they don't necessarily have a week to spend, yep. but they can come and interact for two or three hours, meet the people they want to meet, attend the sessions they want to attend, really productive. So I think there's a lot we can learn about from, you know, around sustaining communities as we figure out how to not fly 
transatlantic flights every five minutes. Yeah. Amanda. I just wanted to pick up on something Liz said there about these diversity tickets. Um, I don't know if Jen Ashley's in the room. So Jen is part of our community work and I was walking around Regent's Park with Cheryl whom Cheryl's not with us today because she's about eight months pregnant. Um, she and I were just chatting and marching and we did this a lot through lockdown. And she said to me, you know how I got into open source, right? And I was like, no, how, why would I know that? You know, how would I know that? And she said, oh, Jen Ashley got me a diversity ticket because it's really difficult to get your foot through the door, right? And once you've got your foot through the door, once you're in my dome, we'll look after you. But it, we don't know who's out there to get in here. And it's not that we don't want people in, but it's hard to, to find those spider's webs of the people we want to track down. So I just want to pick up on that, and I, I fully agree with what Liz is saying. We don't do enough of this. This dome today is our second physical event ever for Open UK. It, you know, it's probably the biggest event we'll ever have, I would imagine, or at least space-wise. But we will try and do more of that, Liz, and we, we need to. In the same way as Matt's encouraging people to sign up to the uh, founders training, and anybody can do that. There'll be a group of uh, mentors that will be limited, but anybody can do the training and all our stuff is free. Um, please, if you know people who you think would like to be involved or want to hang out with us or come to things, please do. I know Alison, Phil, wherever you are, Alison had her hand up and I think she wanted to ask something about this. She's down there. I just wanted to say I really resonated with the point that you have with um, especially getting people into open source. It's quite a challenge because, you know, you're very constrained with how, ex how to explain it. You know, there are only so many maintainers and how do you build out process so that other people can get in the door? Because one thing that I've noticed is there is a giant community of students all over the world who really want to get into open source. but. Um, you know, a challenge is, you know, building out the processes and stuff so that you have mentoring, so that you have programs and that you can educate them how to kind of, you know, start getting involved. And, you know, even, it, it's all, always good that we say, like, good first issue and, like, there are all these things out there, but it can be quite a challenge because to get good first issues, you need maintainers who are, you know, willing to say, you know, that one thing that I could probably go fix in five minutes, um, I'm going to make a good first issue and create an opportunity for someone to just take a step in. So, yeah, just wanted to share that thought Do with you. Know, you know, I think Loena would be a great person. To, sorry, Matt, I'm taking no, over your panel. I, I don't mean to. I think Loena would be great to answer that because it's something that we're trying to address with the kids' camp and in other ways, and I know you were talking about our other education plans next door, but maybe you want to pick those up in here too? Yeah, so it's very important about getting students in particular aware of open source. Um, I mean, I speak from my own experience, and I know that it's not a commonly thought about thing in a university environment. Um, and I'm not, I don't study a computer science degree, but, even in the technology areas which I'm involved with, it's sort of thought of as maybe an afterthought, when in reality, it should be first and foremost. It's so crucial to our development that we cannot afford to forget about it. So this is partly, as I mentioned earlier, what this kids camp is looking to address by having the open source definition as the first thing that you learn about in each of these lessons. We want kids to take that away. And that's why we put it in language that is easier to understand because we don't want the important parts to be missed. Yeah, I just want to bounce off you there, but it's definitely, you know, the key thing for us to continue all these software projects, Kubernetes, et cetera, you know, another 10, 50, 100 years down the line is making sure that we're giving opportunities and we're, you know, building out the path for the next generation to come take over because, you know, I, I can't I can't do open source forever. I'm going to like, you know, one day need to, you know, it, time is a finite resource, right? 
Um, and so, yeah, and especially that point about universities not knowing about open source. And uh, so I studied a comp sci degree. And uh, I think one of the common things in the room was everyone's like, oh, to be able to go anywhere in tech, you need to go find an internship. And it's like this real static path. And, you know, getting more advocacy in universities and schools showing that there is not just one path in tech, there's many things you can do because there are many skills and, you know, it's, it's not all about just coding as well. Like, you know, there's many skills and things that, you know, anyone can kind of take part in and learn and grow. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to finish that thought up and pass the mic down over there. Oh. We've got yeah. a few. Can I, can I just let me do one thing before you do that, Liz, and I'll hand over to you. Um, uh, I mean, we could talk about this all day, you know that. And Alison and I met packing kids' gloves. We put a call out to volunteers, and she came and helped me pack boxes. I know there's a few people in the room who have got happy memories of packing boxes with me. Um, what we were talking about in my car when we were driving out to where the boxes were stored at Ashley's mom's house was that um, we wanted to set something up with students and create some sort of student ambassador network. And I know there's one or two academics in the room. I can see one sitting over there who's a very senior in a university. And I'm sure she's going to take this back. We've also been talking to some of the universities about building modules. So we want to take what we're doing in the kids camp. Next year, we plan to create a knowledge module for an apprenticeship scheme. We should be able to do that in the first six months. We're hoping to then build a GCSE. I thought you were coughing because I said six months. Um, we're <laughs> hoping to the, yeah, well, you'll do well. Uh, we're hoping to build a GCSE or a Scottish hire or something uh, around that and get that out into the marketplace. But from my perspective, many of the developers I know who are the most successful and the happiest didn't go to uni or went to uni and dropped out. So I don't think we should hang too much on having to go to university to be able to code. And we should try and embrace an inclusive culture around that that brings all sorts of people into it. Can, can I um, connect together some of these, the, the points about sort of diversity tickets and opportunities and, and laying out, you know, here are things that you can participate in. I think actually a lot of projects have really good intentions, but aren't necessarily very good at articulating, you know what, we really do want you to come and participate. And some of the really simple things that I've seen, you know, pointed out to projects, like actually, you know, publish when your weekly meeting is and say that everyone is welcome, you know, that you don't have to be an active, you know, you don't have to be a maintainer already to turn okay. up. And it, sometimes we need to be really explicit about that welcoming message and it, it seems well, to work wonders just well. a bit of a, a challenging point for this audience and an inconvenient truth i mean one as an outsider coming in to open one word i've kept on hearing over the past two days is community which has got a nice clickbait properties for it gets a nice round of applause a nice love in trust me it's not doing you any favors what that does is it makes it insular and you start preaching to the converted and if you want to take this room of 200 and turn it into 2,000, you've got to eat your own dog food. You've got to start preaching to the unconverged. So you've got to get rid of that community language. Just give me a cast iron example of a product or a project which is done open versus closed. Then me as an outsider, I buy in. But I'm not hearing it. I'm hearing in community language like we all agree with each other. So That's your challenge. I think that there is an issue, and I'm one of the biggest culprits. I use the term community to mean Andrew Wafa at ARM to mean Jim Craig at Red Hat, to mean the guys from Google, to mean the guys from XYZ, the women from ABC, all of whom participate in this sharing economy through business. So I think maybe we need to get clearer on what we're talking about. Um, I'm gonna quote Mark Shuttleworth, my old boss, who talks about the lens, and he talks about the lens that you look at software through, and he talks about how in the past that the ownership of code was in the hands of the few, and today it's in the hands of the many and that your experience of open depends on, uh, your definition of open depends on your experience. So if you've been a community where individuals are sitting in their basements and bedrooms and sharing, you have that view of it. If you've been in a business community, uh, I think one of the things I worked on was the setup of OpenStack. And uh, my time was given by my company and everybody in that initial project was a business. And ARM and Intel were at the table collaborating and competing. Canonical and Red Hat were doing the same. Dell and HP. So I think when we say community, that's something we probably need to wise up a bit about. 
And we, we've started that with Open UK by talking about the business of open technology. That's a great point. I think we have a question down here at the front. Question over here first, if that's okay. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, you can't see me because I'm in the corner here, uh, but since Amanda mentioned me, I thought I should say something. Um, so I'm one of the associate principals at Strathclyde University. Um, what I've observed today is that, and, and I loved, uh, Lorena, the comments that you made about defining what we mean by open, and, and I, I, I'm an unusual academic, I actually hate definitions because they then become loaded. Um, so I agree with what you're saying about community. Um, but I, so I think when we're defining open, we need to have a really open definition of open. We've already got challenges in STEM being very much um, a single gender um, <laughs> pathway. So the, the whole of the STEM um, economy, we, we really want to try to make that as inclusive. I think the key here is to be inclusive because if we're inclusive, we will become diverse. Diversity doesn't just happen, and it doesn't happen by target setting. It genuinely happens by creating inclusive environments within which people, everyone's voice is welcomed. So I, I think having that really open definition and then having really bloody boundaries, really um, perforated boundaries that allow different organizations um, you, you know, we haven't heard an awful lot about small firms today, and, and that's you know one area that I'm heavily involved in. I, I know many, many small firms that are so committed to the environment and to open. Um, so, and I should also say, with universities, you're you're pushing an open door. You know, at Strathclyde, come and speak to us. We'd be happy to support you in anything that you're doing. And I'm absolutely sure most of my counterparts will, will feel the same. Universities aren't always great at being open themselves, so I'm very well aware of what I'm saying here also. Um, it, it's, we can be ivory towers, and we shouldn't be. We should be flat and open. So I'm happy to speak to anyone about anything to do with open and then how we can help support that and more inclusive access to all forms of education that will help us um, achieve the transition to net zero. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for that comment. Um, I, I've got to say, I've, I've, my company has built a fantastic relationship with um, Bristol University, Computer Science. So we, we started um, an internship scheme and uh, we found a couple of candidates through computer science at Bristol and Kubernetes was not on the, um, on the syllabus at all. We brought an intern in, uh, we taught him about Kubernetes. He decided to go back, he did his um, year uh, project on Kubernetes, he won the award and then the year later, Kubernetes was on the syllabus and they were, trained, they were teaching the entire year on that. So that, that collaboration between business and university, I think is absolutely key. And I'd love to see more of that, especially with smaller businesses. I mean, I was only a business of 10, 10 people at the time, but I still had the ability to do it. And I think that link was just phenomenally successful for, for us. And I think it's something maybe we could repeat uh, more widely across the country. Yeah. No I found it interesting what you said about not liking definitions. And it's something that when we were doing the course, uh, before we had even come across the open source definition, we were finding it quite difficult. It was how do we introduce open source? And mm. even though there are 10 summarized points, which coincidentally works perfectly well with our 10 lessons, <laughs> it's, I would say it's very difficult to define it. You can't summarize all of what open source is in a couple of minutes of each of those lessons. Mm. It's so much more. And what we're really hoping by the kids camp is just to raise awareness and to raise interest in it. Um, and then once they are got that interest peaked, they can learn more about really what open source is. And I think it's a sort of never ending learning curve there. So you're always going to be discovering more about just what open source is. Just to just to add to what Luena said there about what, uh, sorry, I don't know if you heard at the beginning, just to add to what Luena said about the course, um, we partnered with the ODI who are sitting in the audience today and they wrote us 10, uh, I suppose it's mini lessons within the e-zines that accompany the course and Christian has written 
quite significant sustainability material that I don't think exists anywhere else. And again, you know, if it's not the software you're interested in, if it's the data, if it's sustainability and technology and sustainability, all of that is there for you to take. It's all CCSA, attribute us and take it away and reuse it. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think we need to be more focused on how we engage with academia and I need help with that. So if anybody is interested, if anybody's got the skills and wants to get involved, you know, let me know. It's, it's about capturing the imagination of these kids. And I think the gloves do that. You're already doing a great <laughs> job with that, to be honest. But I it's, hope so. it's where we take it from there and how we maybe extend that um, mm. uh, into, into different, maybe uh, universities. There's a couple of questions down here. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Tim. Yeah, hello. Um, yes, it's just that listening to this conversation, um, it was something that Will said right back at the uh, beginning that I think helps things coalesce. Um, I'm sitting here as the chairman of the Scottish Society for Computers and Law, being acutely aware that it's a really quite absurd title because um, there isn't any society for quill pens and law. Maybe <laughs> when quill, quill pens were invented, people thought it was necessary to have a special interest group to talk about how much better quill pens were than chipping things into um, clay tablets. Um, but the point is that the world has moved on beyond computers being something special requiring mm -hmm. evangelization in just an ordinary part of life. Now, the, we're at an interesting transitional stage, I think, with the, quote, open source community because we're still um, preaching the virtues of quill pens over clay tablets. The truth of the matter is that um, open source and open data, open everything, is so much clearly a superior economic model that self-interest would dictate that everybody should adopt it. The problem that sits in the way of that is Will's point about metrics that which we most value we cannot price and that which we least value we price the highest so there needs to be says i stating the obvious without offering a solution there <laughs> needs to be a way in which the economic value economic superiority the appeal if you like to self-interest to the business community of an open model is measured that so that its actual superiority is obvious. And then we don't need to be talking about how shall we pass the baton to future generations to be our successors as voices in the wilderness, because we'll be out of the wilderness. There won't be any wilderness anymore, and I'm sure we can all go on and form some other wonderful new open community. I don't know community of open spaceships or something like that. <laughs> That's a great point. Will, do you want to come back on that? Quick point, and we'll try and get, there's a ton of questions here, so a very quick yeah. point, we'll get back to them. But uh, yeah. okay. if you think about a firm with a piece of code, that's an asset that sits on its balance sheet. If it donates that code to open, it's a one-way bet. It's disposing of an asset, and it gets nothing in return. We know that's not how the world works, but that's how accountancy works. So we need to, accountancy to dance to Archon, not Archon dancing to their beat. There is a lady who's had a hand up yeah, down please. here for a while, so I'm, we have Besides to give her a question. Three questions out here. You're going to be disappointed because it's not a question. It's just <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Audra. I um, do lots of things, but part of the reason why I'm here is because I'm the chair of the board for the Drupal Association, which supports global uh, open source project Drupal. Uh, and the, the challenge that we're facing, it's something that you kind of alluded to there, um, both Amanda and, and Will, is the fact that uh, organizations benefit greatly from open source, but do not, as a practice, it put into it, right? And, and to the point that the young person over here has made about, I can't do open source forever, eventually I'm going to have to get job and get paid. Actually, what we're seeing is contribution in open source is largely funded. Right, where, where it's happening, these, a lot of people are doing it because they're getting paid to do it as part of their job, right? And what we need to do more of is get more organizations to make that commitment into you know, get, making sure that their employees have time to contribute back, 
that they are uh, the the open source that they're benefiting mm -hmm. from. They're making money. Their organization mm -hmm. is thriving because they're using open I source. Um, the that's, the argument is not oh I get this for free. It's I'm I'm getting it and I'm going to be able to put more back into it as an organization and benefit from that as well. So I that's, I want to advocate for that. That's an excellent point and I just I I've, I've lived that myself because I started my, my company and it was focused on professional services and training around open source and that sustained us to a certain point and I had a certain number of people that worked for me and I could put those people into getting a day rate for t time and materials or I could put some of their time into building open source software that's going to be much bigger than them. And I had to make the decision about three years ago when we had a bit of a breakthrough on our open source project that we create, which is called Cert Manager to do certificate management in Kubernetes. And I had to think to myself, am I going to make 30% more revenue from this in these individuals that I would put um, on projects, or am I going to continue to invest in this open source project in the hope that it might grow big enough for us to be able to create a bigger business around? And I decided to take the decision to actually continue to invest in the open source. Thankfully, that was the right decision because then the, the, the project grew much bigger than me and it's just led to so much greater benefits for me and the company and, and what we're doing um, you know, more widely. So I would, I would argue that actually open source gives us a much bigger opportunity than we, we, we otherwise would do if we decided to try and just purely look at the revenue. We have to look at actually the impact of what open source can do on a, on a global basis from a relatively small team in the UK. So I think there's huge opportunities in what we're doing. Unfortunately, Will, we have to wrap up, but I will give people one last comment from the panel, so Will, please. I'll, I'll just take that one very quick. So Ronald Coase, the Nobel Prize winning economist, was at the University of Dundee when he wrote on externalities, who should pay for the pollution of the river. I think most people will know that example. Your question inspires me to think about could you apply externalities to your problem, and I'm pretty sure a theoretical solution could come up. Whether we can put it into practice is maybe something for this group to work on. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that uh, investing in open source is investing in the future. So my work primarily concerns convincing uh, the generations, the younger generations, that open source is really worth their time. Thank you. Liz. I would say I'm pretty optimistic about this idea of you know companies funding open source because it's happening. We're seeing you know hundreds of companies who fund. CNCF and other Linux foundations and other foundations, and they're doing it because they benefit from that software, and the individuals who get involved get paid to contribute to open projects that they really value. I'm very optimistic that we can align peoples and enterprises and foundations and projects' interests. Thanks, Liz. Thank you to the panelists and for everyone for your fantastic questions and to Amanda for making all this happen. <laughs>